Inyaritu's film is very unique, but this this use of the doppelganger is a long-standing literary tradition. Um, you find it really frequently in Victorian literature. Of course, you know everyone knows the picture of Dorian Gray. Dickens used it, um, particularly in the mystery of Edwin Drood. And Dickens' best friend Wilkie Collins uh, wrote one of my favorite novels ever, the mystery called uh, *The Woman in White*. It's used there, and *Doctor Jekyll and Mr. Hyde*. I think there's something about Victorian culture with its um, with its strict prescriptions for behavior and and the you know stark separation of public and private sphere that made these writers have fertile ground to create characters who might meet with another version of themselves and that other self would be you know more carnal or more depraved or more liberated mm -hmm. um, and of course no one was tossing around the word, word neuroscience in the 1800s but why do you think Heather, that you know, neuroscience and artists would intersect. What would it attract a writer or an artist to neuroscience? Well, you know, I think first of all, this use of doppelganger. It's not just with writers. I mean, it's throughout the arts, and because I think artists in general want to try to explore the human condition, and part of the human condition is that we tend to have these two sort of sides of it, and it's of us, and it's in pop culture as well. You know, there's always these cartoons with like the devil on one shoulder right. and the angel on the other, like. Do it. No, don't do it. So, you know, we're always, there is this dichotomy, dichotomy within us that I think artists are just expressing because it, it, it's, it's part of our condition. But, you know, I think it maps out really nicely onto neuroscience is because what, we're, what we know about the brain is that we have these evolutionarily older structures, like, like sometimes called our reptilian brain, that are really responsive to like immediate pleasure. You know, I want that piece chocolate. of chocolate cake. Yeah, that's <laughs> chocolate. I, Right now, right? And then you have the more recently evolved parts of the brain, kind of like your brake system, the prefrontal cortex. And humans have a larger uh, prefrontal cortex in comparison to the rest of the brain than any other animal. And that kind of is thinking about the future consequences of your actions. Freud might call it your superego, right? And you might think, well, maybe, you know, I want to fit into that bikini. I shouldn't have that piece of chocolate cake. But you have these, these subcortical, older sort of id impulses that are always, you know, there's this constant struggle and push and pull between these two. So like, for example, in Birdman, Riggins' character, his alter ego tends to be all id. You know, it's his sort of these, these unconscious drives that sort of voice in your head and he's constantly trying to suppress them. And so it just, for me, it makes sense that they're across the art forms because it's such a big part of what it is to be human. In that movie, from the little bit of like psychology Freud 101 that, that I've gleaned over my lifetime, I, I was thinking that the Riggin character would be what the ego and the id would be the the Birdman character, and then the super ego is is, is it the Zach Galifianakis, like his manager <laughs> and, and his and his ex wife, who are always trying to like talk him down and keep him level. Would you say? Well, you know, according to like the classic you know Freudian psychoanalytic theory, that what it is is that initially your parents, when you're a child, are your super ego because the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed until about the age of 25. So we really don't have an internal mechanism. And that's just in women, right? Right. In men, when is it developed? <laughs> oh God, it's like 45, right. yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, we, we need an external source to kind of control our, our impulses when we're very young because we don't have much of a prefrontal cortex. So Freud would say your parents are your super ego and eventually we internalize their values and that becomes our own. Um, so. Theoretically, the Riggin character should have already internalized these values, but perhaps he hasn't. And so these other characters are playing the role of perhaps like the parents would be and, you know, telling him, you know, he needs to get in line.